Hey, y'all. Uh, I'm Bethany Blunt. I am a production engineer at Facebook. And today I'm going to talk to you about building scalable, resilient technology teams. So first, let me give you some definitions. I am a production engineer at Facebook. So what does production engineering mean? Production engineering at Facebook is similar, but not identical to what you would think of as DevOps or SRE. Uh, we are the torch holders for performance, scalability, reliability, and efficiency for all the services that we embed with. And what we do is we actually take talented operations engineers, generalists typically, we embed with product teams. And then when we embed with product teams, what I mean is they share the same goals, they share the same roadmaps, they share the on-call rotation, because at Facebook, if you help develop a product, you're responsible for keeping it up and running. So like I said, we're looking for people who are strong in coding, we're looking for people who are strong in systems design, people who are strong in systems troubleshooting, and I care a lot about scaling services, so why am I talking to you about scaling teams? Well, I'm an engineer, and I care about scaling systems. But the thing about scaling systems is, in my experience, you can't scale systems unless you can scale the teams that actually support those systems. And right now, I'm a production engineer at Facebook, and it's this big, fast-moving technology company, but it hasn't always been that way. I've worked at tiny companies. I've worked at stodgy companies. I worked at a company that thought it was fun to run social experiments on the employees and see what sticks. And the thing about working in all these places, I've learned a lot of lessons. I've made a lot of mistakes. And I'd like to talk to you about those mistakes today so that hopefully you can avoid making some of them. Though, heads up, you are already making some of them, OK? So first, I think the biggest mistakes that I made have all come from thinking about teams with what I would call the unicorn-centric worldview. And in order to talk about that, I think it's useful to define what I mean by a unicorn. Unicorns are rare. Unicorns are perfect. Unicorns are, that is a lot of text on that slide, right? So let's do this instead. So for the longest time, this is how I saw every single person I worked with and every single person that I talked to about potentially joining one of our teams. Either I was caring for unicorns or I was hunting for unicorns. These are my mistakes and y'all do not have to make them. But like any plan, when you think you're going to go down into a road that's unknown, there are monsters, monsters everywhere. And I can help you avoid some of them, but probably not all of them. So the first thing that you need to do is you need to build your team for the goals you want your team to achieve. Let me tell you what I mean by that. Mistake number one in the unicorn-centric worldview is looking at the people you have on your team as a loosely federated group of individuals who organically decide what they like working on and kind of let everything else go. There are some serious problems with this from a resiliency standpoint. We heard a lot about resiliency earlier. Uh, you don't have the overlap. And you don't have the coordination and the way that people work together in order to accomplish bigger goals. So when you're thinking about scaling systems, you have to think about what you want the systems to be able to do. You have to think about what the performance characteristics of your systems would be. Thinking about your teams in a similar way is very useful. You have to give yourself time to think about, what does a perfect team look like for me, independent of the people you have now? What are the things this team needs to do to be successful? Who are our customers? Internal customers, external customers, it doesn't matter. What do they need from us? What do you need from your team to help you support them? And then, of course, there's all the technical work. What are the technical skills your team needs? What about on-call? On-call can be brutal. And if you have too few people manage an on-call rotation, it can be really brutal. If your on-calls are particularly difficult, do you need people to join you and build the skills to help make the system so that they heal more quickly and your on-calls aren't so terrible? Or is it just that maybe you need enough bodies that you can share things around and people can have a life outside of work? You need to think about what your ideal team would look like so you have an idea of what you're going towards. But you can't just do that. You have to think about where you're starting from also. So now that you have an end state in mind, you have to define your starting point. You should consider questions about the current people on your team in order to do this. What are the skills we already have? Maybe you're good at running a lot of the stuff you already have. Maybe you have some weak spots. Where is your team weak? 
This is the one where what you want to look for is you want to have the things where your team thinks they're badasses and actually keep dropping things on the floor. That's the place to look right there. And then are there skills that you can grow with the people that you already have in your teams? What if you did some investment and actually supported people to help them grow and develop themselves? Is there some help that you want to get from the outside? Do you want a consultant to come in or a short-term contractor to come in and shore up some of your stuff so that you have a little burst and a little bit of extra boost? Um, the trick here is that you have to resist only seeing your team through the perspective of the people that you already have. Now, as a snapshot, you have to think about the future, and you have to think about it from a perspective of where you need to be going to. Otherwise, you fall into the unicorn trap, right? That's how teams end up organically structuring themselves in a way that comes back to bite you. And I will tell you right now a story where this happened to me. Here is my cautionary tale. Unicorn A. Goddess of all data systems, knows everything about everything, about how everything is stored inside the infrastructure. Absolutely brilliant. I don't need to worry about that part because she's got it covered. Unicorn B, lord of the inherited system, the one that we got from some guy who left two years ago and we all depend on it to make our stuff work, but he's got it under control, so I don't have to worry about that one either. And then Unicorn C can troubleshoot anything you put in front of him, except that he cannot freaking ship anything. So I would argue he's not a real unicorn, but okay, we let it go. And then when life happens to one of these people, when somebody's mom dies, or they decide they're gonna go move on, then what happens? You have a team that's not resilient, and I had this gap. It was really, really painful. The next thing about a unicorn-centric worldview is that it leads you to be looking for the one perfect hire who will make your team complete. And of course, my unicorn, your unicorn, her unicorn, they all look different, right? We all want different things, we all have different expectations for what we think about for that one perfect hire. And you're gonna say, of course your unicorn looks different than mine. You work at Facebook, I don't work at Facebook, my needs are different than yours. But what I'm gonna tell you now is that inside your teams right now, if you're doing the one perfect hire approach to people joining your team, you have people on your team right now who have very different views of what that perfect hire looks like. They are sitting right next to each other. There's too much variability in this process. You've got to get the variability out of the process to figure out who is the right person to join your team. Not only that, but once you get a new hire and they come in, even if it's somebody you've worked with before, and you know that he is a total badass, he's in a new environment now. And so he's almost definitely not going to be what you expected. You can't expect people in systems to just swap in. Swap. People can't swap the same as systems. They're different. They're going to behave different in different environments. So how do you get out of the trap of looking for one perfect hire? You have to start by getting real signal from your interviews. Given that everyone has a different picture of what the one perfect hire looks like, if you aren't really clear about what the goals are for doing an interview, you're gonna end up in the situation where, again, from my experience, I ask my favorite questions, you ask your favorite questions, they are exactly the same questions, we got nothing new. Or, the other side of this is, I ask my favorite questions, you ask your favorite questions, and we got no actual usable signal because our, our favorite questions kind of suck. So what you need to do is you need to plan for every interviewer to take on a specific role to understand what they're probing for when they're talking to a new candidate, right? At Facebook and Production Engineering, we do interviews for systems, we do interviews for network, we do interviews for troubleshooting, we do interviews for coding. We do all these different signals to learn as much as we can about somebody, and then we come back together and we try to get a picture of whether that we think that person would be really successful in our environment. It's not about ticking the boxes, it's about understanding how somebody can be successful in your team and getting a rounded picture. You also need to examine your hires and your rejections. Now, you wouldn't actually have a system where you never looked at the metrics and then declared victory that everything was working. If you don't look at how you're choosing to not hire people and how the people you have hired are turning out inside your team, how they're performing, are they happy, are they successful, are they scaling? It's like having a system where you never actually look at your performance metrics. So, do you know why you are rejecting the people that you reject. The people you say no hire, do you know why you rejected them? Sometimes maybe you reject them because they aren't strong technically. 
Sometimes you may reject them because you've got that one person who loves his puzzle question, and if people don't answer it exactly the right way, they're out. There's a whole variety of reasons why you may be rejecting people. On the other hand, how are the people that you have brought on, how are they doing? Are they awesome? Are they successful? Are they kind of struggling? Did you get the signal in the interviews that you did before somebody joined to get an idea of how well they were going to perform once they joined your team? Is this actually the person you want? Are your questions good? Um, you want to do a retrospective from time to time on your teams. You don't want, this is not a one-time process. You want to do this from time to time because it'll help you really understand how you are successfully going to grow and add new people to your teams. The last thing you need to do is really invest in leadership. So when you start to build these teams and they are more diverse and you don't have the expectation that everyone's in their silos, it can be much more difficult to coordinate whatever challenges come up. Technical decisions, uh, prioritization calls, personality challenges. This is not about management, this is about leadership. And each of you already have people in your mind, I'm sure, who are the natural leaders on your teams. You want to try to find a way to invest and develop them, and you do not need to be a, be a company the size of Facebook to do that, and you don't need to be in HR, and you don't need to be in learning and development. I just came back from London, where I had the opportunity to do an offsite for some Facebook engineers. It's an offsite we do for leadership development. There are some engineers who are uh, individual engineers and some managers, by engineers, for engineers. You can do this if you decide to make that investment. So finally, do the summary. You want to build your team for the goals you want to achieve. Stop looking for one perfect hire. Get real signal from your interviews. Figure out why you're rejecting people and figure out how the people that you're bringing on board are actually performing. And don't forget to invest in leadership. Because in the end, the goal through all of this is to build a team that has planning, deliberate growth, and is resilient to life happening to people inside your teams. Because as we all learned from that wonderful documentary, Jurassic Park, life finds a way. Putting all of your eggs in one basket is not going to be the way to grow your team. And what you'll find in the end is that if you invest in your teams in this way, not only are you going to come up with a team that works better than the sum of its parts, but you will find that what you've actually managed to build is a better unicorn. So thank you all for listening to my rant. I really appreciate it.